Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Let me start off by saying, don't say I didn't warn you. Last year when Geraldine Talley died, I told you that Susanna Mushad Jones was going to be next. Susanna Mushad Jones was the oldest person in the world at 116, and she died recently in Brooklyn. She was born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1899. One of the last two people alive was born in the 19th century. And here's a report from The Guardian. She was recognized as the world's oldest living person. Susanna Jones died on Thursday in New York City at the age of 116. Affectionately known as Miss Susie, this was Jones last year at her birthday party at the Vandalia Senior Center in Brooklyn, where she lived. Jones was born in Alabama in 1899 and was the daughter of sharecroppers and the granddaughter of slaves. She retired in 1965 and had said her secret to longevity was lots of sleep and never smoking or drinking. Jones's death now leaves a 116-year-old woman in Italy, Emma Morano Martinuzzi, the oldest living person, according to the Gerontology Research Group. Okay, consider yourselves warned. Emma Morano of Piedmont, Italy, the last person born in the 19th century who's still alive, is going to be next. And you'll hear about her at the beginning of one of these podcasts. Well, one of our themes tonight is going to be advertising. We're going to talk about two of the great advertising men of the 20th century, guys who made iconic advertisements. And we're going to start with James Travis, who died recently at the age of 83. James Travis was born in the Midwest, moved out to New York after college to work in advertising, and joined the legendary Jerry Delafamina. In 1970, he created this ad for Blue Nun Wine that put it on the map using Jerry Stiller and Ann Mira, and we've done Ann Mira's podcast recently. Excuse me, miss, but you seem to be having trouble picking out a wine. Maybe I can help you. Oh, I'm sorry, but I never talk to strangers. Oh, how did you know? What do you mean, how did I know? You're a stranger. Right, Elliot Stranger. Is that really your name? No, it's really Elliot Swerdlick, but I do meet a lot of pretty girls this way. I like you, Elliot. You're weird, but I like you. Maybe he can help. See, I'm having some friends over for smorgasbord, some shrimps, a little cheese, some meatballs. What kind of wine can you serve with all those things? May I suggest you have a little blue nun at your smorgasbord? Oh, I don't think she'd have a very good time. Besides, it's going to be all couples. Oh, no. Blue Nun wine. It's a delicious white wine that's correct with any dish. Meat, fish, cheese, meatballs. Oh, Blue Nun. Oh, Elliot, you made me a convert. I suppose you're going to drink it religiously. <laughs> yeah, it's going to become a real habit. Blue Nun. The delicious white wine that's correct with any dish. Another Seychelles wine imported by Shefflin and Company, New York. James Travis also supervised the Joe Izusu commercials, which were primarily visual. But he could be considered the father of cat videos on the internet because he did this commercial for Meow Mix, which pretty much ingrained the anthropomorphized cat in everybody's consciousness. Meow, 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 meow. Mix comes in two varieties, original and seafood middles. A medley of mackerel, tuna, and crunchy centers bursting with seafood flavor. Meow Mix. Tastes so good, cats ask for it by name. Meow. Yeah, as one cat said to another, dogs may be more popular in the movies, but we rule the internet. But James Travis' greatest accomplishment was one of the great political advertisements of all time. Probably next to the Lyndon Johnson girl picking daisies before the atomic bomb, it is the greatest political advertisement. It's the Ronald Reagan Morning in America that he used for his 1984 re-election campaign, and it helped solidify his legacy. It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980, nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. This afternoon, 6,500 young men and women will be married. And with inflation at less than half of what it was just four years ago, they can look forward with confidence to the future. It's morning again in America. And under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger and better. Why would we ever want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? Whatever.
whatever your political persuasion, that was a hell of an ad. Well, we're going to move on now to another legendary ad man, Bill Backer, who died recently at the age of 89. He is famous for one ad, but it might be the most famous television commercial in history. It's the 1971 Coca-Cola ad, I'd like to teach the world to sing, that's been seen in over 50 countries and was so famous it closed the long-running cable television series about advertising in the 1960s, Mad Men. Here's Bill Backer to talk about it. Yeah, I'm proud of having co-created. I didn't do it all by myself. It's generally considered the world's most popular commercial, and, and anybody is proud to be associated with something that's, that's popular and, and I think very good. When television commercial was released, it had the biggest impact of any commercial I've ever been associated with. The letters poured into the Coca-Cola company, and the Coca-Cola company has always been very cognizant of what the public writes about them and to them. I think they said something like 700 letters or 1,000 letters that were dumped on the, the desks of the president, because some of them just said, President Coca-Cola Company Atlanta, that kind of stuff, and they all got there. People liked to be liked, and they were being liked, so we were all very excited. As far as I know, the course ran on almost every country of the world that, that speaks English, and they all understood it, that it was a product saying we can be a little social catalyst that can bring people together, talk things over, and sometimes communications get better if you're just sitting over a bottle of Coke and looking people in the eye. I'd like to build the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to buy the world a coat and keep it company. Cause that's the real thing. What the world wants today is the real thing. And here's how the actual commercial sounded in 1971. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I like to teach the world to sing. Sing with me. Perfect harmony. Perfect harmony. I like to buy the world a book and keep it company. That's the real life. Well, we're going to move on now to Julius LaRosa, who died recently at the age of 86, a nice Italian boy from Brooklyn. He was good-looking and a moderately talented singer in the early 50s, but he became famous because he was a regular on the Arthur Godfrey show, and Arthur Godfrey had one of the most popular shows on radio and television, and Arthur Godfrey fired him during the broadcast. And what that did is it bought sympathy for Julius La Rosa, but it destroyed Arthur Godfrey's reputation as a nice guy. He was seen as the cold-hearted SOB that he really was. In fact, a face in the crowd starring Andy Griffith is reportedly modeled on Arthur Godfrey. Here's the story of Julius LaRosa and Arthur Godfrey in 1953 from the History Channel. When Arthur Godfrey returned to broadcasting after his hip surgery in 1953, his popularity had never been greater. And now, here's that man himself, Arthur, let a Godfrey. Hello, hello. But there was another voice also capturing the hearts of millions of Americans in 1953. The voice of Arthur's boy singer, Julius La Rosa. That year, Julius had two hit records. At first, Arthur couldn't have been more pleased. Well, look, what I want you to do, Bobby, if you will, is give me a real close-up of that push. Oh, but once Arthur know. came back to his shows, things about Julius began to bother him. Like, for instance, the fan mail. He's been in the business 30 years, and he's getting four or 5,000 letters a week. I'm in the business a minute and a half, and I'm getting six, 7,000 letters. And for some reason, he felt threatened by that. And then there was the matter of the dance lessons. All the little Godfreys were required to take ballet classes to help them move more gracefully on camera. But one week, Julius missed a lesson because of a family emergency. Arthur wasn't happy. I went to uh, work the next morning, and there was a thing on the bulletin board, since you felt your services weren't needed at yesterday's dance class, we won't need you today. That upset me. Julius was so upset that he broke an unwritten Godfrey law. He went and got an agent and a manager. Arthur told all of us that they shouldn't go out and get managers. 
or an agent because if he had to deal with all the agents, he'd never get his shows on the air. And the thing that uh, upset him was that agent, or the manager, I forget which one now, sent him a letter. In the future, all dealings with Judas or Rosa will be handled through my office. Big slap in the face. Big slap in the face. Arthur consulted the top brass at CBS as to how to handle the situation. With their approval, Arthur decided to fire Julius the same way he hired him, right on the air. It happened on Monday morning, October 19th, 1953. So the morning of the dismissal, I was supposed to be on at 10 in the morning. First segment, I wasn't on. Second segment, I wasn't on. Third segment, I wasn't on. Fourth segment, on the sixth segment, which started at 11.15, 10 minutes into it, calls. The television portion of the morning show had concluded, but millions were still tuned in to the radio-only portion. I first met Julie. I'll never forget when he first came here and went to work steadily. He said to me, gee, I don't know, with all those stars on the show. And I said to him, Julie, you don't know it, but I don't have any stars in my show. In my show, we were all just a nice big family of very nice people. And I would like Julie, if he would, to sing me that song called Manhattan. Have you got that? Yes, sir. Sing me that. Joyce went out absolutely innocently, sang his little heart out as he always did. Thanks ever so much, Julie. That was Julie Swan's song with us. He goes now out on his own, as his own star, soon to be seen in his own programs. And I know you wish him Godspeed, same as I do. This is the CBS Radio Network. Julius walked off. He came back in. He said, was I just fired? Julius couldn't believe what he just heard. Neither could America. They had a bunch of psychologists analyzing how the audience reacted to this. And he said that like, the audience was the mother, Arthur was the father, and Julius was the son. And the whole psychological thing of that was like that the father had thrown the son out of the house, and they never forgave him for it. That was the, one of the great broadcasting mistakes of all time, because what he did that day was against everything we'd taken him to be. Arthur was forced to hold a press conference to explain why he had fired Julius. His explanation became as infamous as the firing itself. Julius, he said, had lost his humility. Now, talk about the pot calling the kettle black. One thing you could never accuse Arthur of is having overly humble opinions or things like that, and they picked up on that. And boy, they nailed his hide to the cross for that one. And it was all downhill from that point on. Dear Mr. Godfrey, listen to my plea. Hire me and fire me and make a star of me. I will be so grateful if it can just be done. Hire me and fire me, Ed Sullivan, here I come. Well, that was the beginning and the end for Arthur Godfrey, but Julius LaRose's career had a brief moment, and it never took off after that either. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps, and we're going to close tonight with Madeline LeBeau, who died recently at the age of 92, the last surviving credited cast member from the immortal film Casablanca. After cozying up to the Nazis, she has an acute bout of conscience and patriotism. She's in the famous scene singing La Marseillaise over the Nazis, and saying Viva la France at the end. Here it is. Viva la France.